really excited to share space with all of you um, and, and to share this work. And so I'm just gonna share a screen and uh, you please let me know if there's difficulty in seeing what I'm sharing with you all. Okay, so just as a small introduction, I'm uh, going to be sharing work from my current collection, A Comic Year Tonight, as well as a couple poems from another collection called um, Does the Earth, and then as well as a, um, some of my more recent work that I'm doing on a collection that's focused on motherhood. I recently had a baby. Um, she's 15 months old, and uh, the transition into becoming the human that is a mother to her is is a wild thing. So I'll be collecting up work um, to share with the world about that as well. So all of that stuff is coming right at you. Um, this co first collection, A Comic Year, was based on a project I did after the end of a long-term relationship. I'd uh, been in a relationship for two years that was um, emotionally intense and really rewarding in a lot of ways. And so when it ended, I was grief stricken. Um, to manage that grief, I wrote a poetry comic every day for a year, starting the day following the breakup. And I collected up a series about 150 comics from that collection that I amassed. And it became this book, A Comic Year. So the version of me that you are meeting in these comics is a, um, a sort of bewildered, sad, and then increasingly more triumphant human um, across the year because at first I was heartbroken and then the purpose of the collection is to sort of witness grief as it works its way through um, art and the human heart, namely mine. So uh, we will, we're gonna begin with day 33, about a month into the project. Um, I'm gonna, I'm also, I have more here than I need. So I'll probably, I'll do my best to get through a lot of it, but some of it you'll just see flashing past you. This first one is at day 33. At the start of many romance films, we are invited into an intimate view of the main character's morning routine. Mostly, it's the woman's day we see, and it's meant to tell us something important about how uniquely beautiful and relatable she is, how ready to be loved. Her routine is a delicate performance of her waiting for the story of her love to begin, rather than the simple monotony of toothbrushing and coffee making, of slipping her slippers underneath the foot of the bed. And when the loneliness I feel is particularly keen, I imagine a camera above my left shoulder and an unseen director whispering, action, as though this will improve the lighting or the chances that today something else will happen. Um, this next one is a true story. I'm happy to tell you more about it anytime you like. On the drive home today, I saw a family walking together hand in hand down the road. It's showing signs of spring, but the kids were still in snowsuits and matching hats. It feels like we live in dangerous times, so maybe we should all just walk around holding hands. It's too bad we grow up or stop, grow up and stop, or reserve our hands for lovers or husbands. I was once walking home a bit whiskey drunk from a date I stopped to clip lilacs from a neighbor's bush with scissors I'd brought in my purse for the task. A man, a young man, my age and a little tipsy himself, stopped to talk to me. When he offered to walk me home, he took my hand and I let him. The random and unexpected intimacy felt nice. My father would have disagreed with this decision, but being single is like the Wild West, a land of strangers and flowers and shotguns. I got home safe. Sometimes your senses abandon you, and in the morning, you thank your lucky stars that it turned out all right. Um, this next one is from day 158, and I think really, for me, encapsulates a lot of the hardest feelings I had during this period. Um, 
and there are it's followed by a lot more <laughs> kind of up moments. Um, but this was kind of at the center of how I was feeling. As I walked home from a first date yesterday, I felt as I walked to a first date yesterday, I felt as numb as a cinder block and worried that my sexy is broke. Here, it's a raspberry and it's not broken, but walled off the way a baby that grows and dies outside the womb can be walled off with calcium deposits if left untreated. The stone babies are flagged by the body as non-self and the immune system isolates them to protect their, protect their mother. I gained a lot of weight in the last two years. My body didn't feel like my own. I aged and drank too much wine and the walls began to form. The sexy is actually the erotic by Audre Lorde's definition, the vital creative force that taught me how to sing. And now um, I put into my poems and this artwork. It also puts color in the sky and draws me to others, asks me to make love with them. Trump's election and difficulties with, with led me to eating and drinking more. The walls around that core erotic raspberry went solid to protect me maybe, or because my sorry brain looked at my fat body and said that that beauty was non-self and had to be quarantined. With all other dangers, stopped touching me and it was all confirmed. I was too ugly for loving, for making, for love making. It felt like when I was young and decided I could not pursue a, a career in singing because I had a big nose and I didn't want my face on posters. It's been weeks and months now, and I take much better care of myself. I taste raspberry more and more, but it's a choice I have to make each day to not just deny myself the song of being loved and loving. So one thing I forgot to mention is that in this collection, um, there's a blank space in many of the sentences that takes the place of my former partner. Now, um, that was an aesthetic decision that I made, but it was also by request because this uh, former partner of mine in the small town where our love ended um, needed privacy to move on. And I was posting these, uh, collect these comics on social media. And so I made the decision to, rather than give him a pseudonym, I made a blank space. And, I, and because I did that, I think that it does something with grief that um, feels truthful to me where it's an empty space of sort of blankness that lives inside you, that as the grief continues, it doesn't shrink, but the words around it, the world around it, the life around it increases. And hopefully by compar comparison feels a bit smaller and more manageable. So if you get the collection or if you have the collection, you'll notice these blanks. It's the space where he is and was um, and, and where my grief lived. Okay, I'm just gonna read off of my book because that might be a little bit easier for this one. Um, so one second, just have to track it down. Okay, this is from day 233, so a bit further along. Um, I sometimes fantasize about getting all my old lovers and boyfriends in the same room. I'd use it as a focus group ask them a bunch of questions, compare them, sort them, and attempt to recognize a pattern that leads me into the future. Love often defies logic for me. I assume it would help. It occurs to me though, that the only reason these men would gather from different parts of the world would be for my funeral. My funeral where my future is done and in a box. I once wrote a poem where I was Eve attending Lilith's funeral. Lilith, the dark witchy power in all women, had been killed. Eve opened her casket like Pandora's box to free her. What both thought was dead returns like a tide. All of my relationships still live in me, even in small ways like the curled currents at the shoreline or as massive waves crashing and receding inside me. The ocean is never dead and neither am I, just shifting. So I think, let me just check. Um, I'll read just one more from this collection then I'll move on to um, a couple of poems. Um, this one is one of my favorites partially because it 
it just characterizes how I feel about the rest of humanity and um, how, how dearly I love them. When I look at other people, I remember them as babies, dragging a blanket behind them or working a bottle, or as dominant primates seeking safety, shelter, sleep, salt, and pleasure, or as souls, as silver, or as meat slung over bone, as whistlers, drinkers, as consumers of other animals, as, or as skeletons with jaws hanging open and closed, possessors of calcium. I imagine them clenching their teeth or their parents having sex, their mothers in pain, their brains electric with candy, as sleepers rolling over, as those that have a taint or the sea star of the asshole, them as naked and having a preferred way to die. No one wants to drown or they do. No one wants to go up in flames or they do. In dark rooms they rest, they wish down to the faint hairs on their toes and their follicles to be touched and to touch. I remember their audacity. All right, and my, so thank you, my audacious friends here for um, sharing this space with me. So this next, um, this next poem is to do just with the process of, of becoming pregnant. So um, as many folks know, either from experience or from family and friends that have this experience, it can be really challenging. And so by now, this in this phase of my life, I've met a partner and we've decided to have a baby. And so the, this has to do with the, the intensity of that. Tiny house. My father spent an afternoon wrestling a tree stump, stump from the ground so he could bring it home to my mother. All of September, they turned it into a fairy house. My mother delicately exacto knives petals off of pine cones for roof tiles and tore tufts of moss to soften small beds and chairs. My father set three inch tables with plates made from acorn caps and mushroom mugs. At the end of the season, it comes apart. The pieces are strewn back into the brush and the stump is prepared for bearing winter. My body is delicate and unknown to me. Each month, a downy dark home is built and then absorbed into the forest. We try again for a child and fail. I curse like a crone all the unseen parts of me. In dreams, I am more gentle. A voice rings through mourning saying, you must forgive your body for what it has done. Um, and now another poem <laughs> about the process of getting pregnant. Um, I just wanted to give it a little pair before we moved into the motherhood piece. Um, this is another true, true story and it's called The Turn. A woman fishing at the water's edge in Exeter casts a line out to watch it straighten with the sinker's weight. A turn caught sight of the sinker and dove after it, tangling in the line. I watched the fisherwoman reel it in slowly. The bird was achingly white, ink black, a soft absence she unwound herself from. Once free, the bird clattered from her hands, smoothed itself into the sky, and then landed again in the water, silent, turning in the current. I'm pregnant again. Unknowingly, I brought her home from New Orleans. The baby is new, a few countable cells, but growing. It will be months unwinding a child from this, the tangled drunken pads her father and I took through the French Quarter to get back to the hotel and conceive her. No matter how badly we wanted her, it was in the moment we weren't thinking that she dove for my gut. I have to be so careful now, move with the mercy I learned from that woman tall in the grass. So my child is born whole, so she won't fly from me half ensnared and tear herself apart. Hour over hour, I braid her to this life. I'm thrilled to report that my baby was born last October. She is the coolest human. She's going, she's asleep right now. Her name is Minerva. We call her Minnie. She's loud and silly and wonderful. 
And so um, it's a joy to read that poem and to have her here. So some of these pieces that I'll read now are also within the context of the pandemic. And so um, they, they sort of discuss that a bit. Um, so I'll, I'll read this, this comic that I wrote in the process of being pregnant and oh, kind of isolated in the home, in our home. Brandon and I are both teachers. This means quarantine sent us both home. It became three months alone together. We had a rough start. I, newly pregnant, slept poorly and got sad, ended up in the guest room a few times watching TV to knock myself out. This made him feel heart sore, like he was on his own. We talked it out. I started listening to podcasts instead and managed to sleep a bit better in our room. We fell into a good rhythm as the weather improved. Chores and work in the morning, art in the afternoon, naps together, and making dinner to watch a show at night. I finished book edits. Brandon built a garden. Pre-pandemic, I dreamed of this kind of time together with him. I didn't know this is how I would get it. We're lucky, the slowness of our life while I grow the baby and happy when we're not angry or afraid listening to the news. This week, he returns to work and I tend the house. I need a nap by 1 p.m. The cat chews my hair. I miss him. It's the weird blur that is that early quarantine time. I feel like we were all experiencing. Um, this one, okay, I just wanna move along a little bit. Um, to read some of my more recent pieces. This, uh, this was recently published in the Indianapolis Review. Um, it's, and it's part of that larger collection I mentioned uh, that will contain poems about motherhood. And so here is, here is this one. Going outside hurts sometimes. The earth feels the most beautiful in her illness. The clouds are bigger more variable. The wind pushes harder and the leaves clamor. Each season feels turned up, exaggerated and radiant. It's a beauty that tips into terrifying like Rilke's angels. My daughter is sick. Runny nose and chest congestion, a rattling cough that wakes the house. Her cheeks flush with fever and her eyes bright with exhaustion. I ache looking at her. I ache looking at my own mother. Her age shows in photos, blue eyes shining outward from a field blistering with sunflowers. The allure of everything in brilliant cycles all day. Is it wrong to say so during this era of disease and extremes? An absurdity like the consumption fad of the 18th and 19th centuries. Lit Hub's Christina Newland quotes historian Roy Porter, bright young things positively sought to look tubercular as if delicacy and ten a tenuous grasp on life made them more appealing. I am easily lured. Maybe it's that I feel myself as the solid core of all of it, dull and sturdy, tied back hair and dishpan hands, watching as the world brightens with need all around me. The earth, my daughter, both cast with a bit of Keats glamour and frailty, rousing the glare of my heart. Me, not them, with a romantic anguish. How it is with beauty. It swallows you whole and lets you burn in its throat. It's a pressure. I can feel it. All right, and I'm gonna finish up um, with just two more. Um, this one is, that's little mini there. I take three deep breaths to the rhythm of the breast pump. It croaks and columns my nipples, strangles milk from me in thimbles. This is the scale, the ounce, the milliliter, the drop my daughter takes on her tongue hungrily, becoming more angry with what I can't produce, screaming into my breast like it's a cave. There's a form of meditation where you focus on increasingly small details. You discover a place by its shadows and dust mites. 
You might not have to travel anywhere. If you can remain where you are more completely, seeing further into a single room, the firework of its daily alterations. My daughter is a small house, all constantly shifting, tiny breaths like the hush of sand being dragged into furrows. I'm told constantly to pay attention, take in every minute. This time where she is soft and tucked as a peony travels away from me with speed. I repeat aloud in the apartment, empty of anyone but us, don't skip ahead to when you're certain she thrives and survives you. Stay here, stay here, stay here. All right, here's my last one. Um, that's some nettles there. And I really appreciate all of you being here with us tonight. Mothering brings on a forced synesthesia. Greek for perceiving together, the brain of a synthete blurs the boundaries of the senses, so some can feel music or taste color. When I was pregnant, I drank sleep in long blue droughts. Now she is here, and my eyes hardened into teeth devour her with long looks. Gwendolyn Brooks called it the gobbling mother eye. Minnie's book wails, I'll eat you up, I love you so. When Minnie cries, it slips under my skin, a soft voltage, a shirt of nettles lifting me from sleep. My brain is rewiring, constructing a delicate electric architecture around her, through her, connections so tangled that barriers fail and I am transformed in her closeness. When she drinks, I feel her chest heavy thirst. I relax when Brandon strokes her hair. There will be traces of her, genetic remnants, for decades. So I am a mother, a fresh synthete, a willing chimera, more or less myself than I've ever been. Love is too small a word. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I, um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much. I am so grateful that you shared these poems and these visual poems and these works of art. I am, I don't, I'm not speaking for everyone, but I'm, I was observing people's smiles and nods and um, so thank you for your vulnerability and for your poetry. Um, and for anyone who came a little bit late, um, hopefully you caught some of Meg's reading and display. And now we, I will, pass the torch, I won't keep it for very long, pass it over to Julia C. Alter for some poetry. Thanks, Francis. Um, thank you, Meg. Um, I was just reflecting on um, Meg and I read together like five years ago um, when I was pregnant with my son, Theo. Um, so it feels like really sweet to be reading together. And it's like, full circle, one of like many circles. Um, I'm really happy to be here and thanks Francis for organizing this. Um, I'm just gonna jump in. I'm reading off my screen, so um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Toilet paper panic. In town, I pass street art a circle of beasts and birds and the words, we are not superior. It was there before the virus. It feels subversive to be out walking in the sun, like I should bolt the doors around myself in the dark. What if we eliminate it and it doesn't disappear? We've forgotten we can dig a ditch and bury it we can use leaves already fallen. We're so scared of holes, of our own ancient dirt, of burials. Unprepared to digest what we're taking in, we say scat and we mean feces, jazz, the tiny line between chaos and order, or we mean go away. Night soil, manure without moonlight. 
extruded from an animal like we were. Bubbles. The mother's practiced mouth can blow many smaller bubbles or a big one hanging by a swirling seam of soap. She wonders how many afternoons of bubbles her child's gleaming face raised to the sun it would take to wash the night from her. Here is everything she thought she'd need a wand to conjure but some days are still spatter. There is shit a whole cascading rainbow can't clean. Who is the mother who has washed out a mouth? The black kettle whistles, ink clouds around cuttlefish. Who is the mother embodying a child's blue sky, not varying chromatics of night? Who is the mother, bright and clean, who sees a circle as anything other than a black hole? Some mornings she's the astronaut, some mornings she's gravity. One morning before her shower, her child finds the center, push, pushing shadowy fur aside, trying to climb back in. only the snow. I can't be more than my one body if I'm not my one body first. I can't be more than my body. Remember, no one can come in with you. Remember the roof's gray. It will feel electric, wrapping nerves in numbness. The shock will shine like a bad diamond, like a light contraction, but taking something away. Outside, a single crow will scour the snow for silver. Tonight, only the snow can hold me. I said no to a new life. It was easy, barely anything there. Who makes milk? Cows, I want to say. But I say mamas. I say mammals, whales even. Milk is made by a wound. Or that's how I made it for you. The unmaking, the undrinking, the blue empty, blue translucent. Suck teeth make it. Beasts make it. Other mothers, better mothers, udders, plastic wheezing suction cups, hands pulling down, hands stirring yellow powder into water, factories, flowers, women who weep in the shower rolling their last pearls down the drain, thunder, hunger, your mouth, some whisper in your saliva, a harder mouth, a darker whisper, lips pulling, teeth, prayers, nipples that will never heal, trees, breathing things. Um, the next two poems are part of a series that I've been working on for a couple of years. Um, they're poems that are all titled non-monogamy with um, different subtitles, uh, ongoing project. Um, non-monogamy, bad reasons. When I say I love you, you say covered in wings or covered in wind, a band name, or a catalog of alibis. The most private thing is an alien, a tent of hair, a mushroom. And a mushroom is a big white shaggy heart multiplying in the dark 
without blood, without seed, a mirror of owls, a scale of fish, our sacred geometry, and the sounds we make on snow. Non-monogamy, sunflower. If you let your hair loose and become a sunflower, if you find the perfect filter for the stars, a device, a dial, if we find a way to comprehend the pupil of an echinacea or how we came to be standing here with a blowtorch trying to ignite a damp pile of leaves, if swirling ash becomes the flit of a bat or a hand is a crotch but also a whole body, if a shooting star is made out of titanium, if we hear an EDM cover of walking in Memphis while pulling our clothes down to black, if you say, I want you like that, or you say, she sent you a hat, if you live at the top of that hobbling, no one can reach you all winter, if you pull frozen pizzas through the woods on a sled, or the center of the center is red, if it makes you feel small or like anything is possible or nothing, if wool socks in August, if the tickling story leaves me speechless, if you're alone in the MoMA, if you're kneeling behind me on the bed and I lower my face into blackberries. When a bird gets trapped in your house, your son is on your lap, biting the heads off cheddar bunnies. You send a silent prayer to the God of children and winged things that his dad's girlfriend picks him up for the weekend before the bird gets really frenzied, chittering and shitting, her anxiety gathering bile up into your throat. You don't ask your neighbor, Mr. Irby, what to do about the bird freaking out in your house because you don't want to remind him you're a woman living alone with her son or on other days just living completely alone or feel your shame at knowing nothing about how to free a trapped thing or feel your shame at building a house with a window no one can reach, not even with a ladder. Shame for not having a ladder and shame for having a window only a bird can reach, believing it's her way back to the sky. And if she bangs so hard, she forgets her body, she'll get there. You watch her slam her tiny body into that window for an entire afternoon. You chug wine and walk in circles and Google how to free trapped birds. The way they say to do it is with another person and a sheet, but you can't reach anyone and you can't reach her. So you open the screen doors and leave a light on the porch and the bowl of bird seed your son put out before he left for the weekend, thinking maybe she's like a dog and would follow the scent of the seed. You get in your car and drive to a musty apartment, get under the sheets, slam your body into something and hope it gets you free. Swan. It's her actual name. I'm dancing alone and it isn't a metaphor. My body in the window, my body's blue movement in the blue vervain reflected in the window. I don't know how to make the tinctures I need from these wildflowers in my own backyard. When the beat drops, moths rise around me. I'm not saying I'm luminous, just that I have a cigarette in my mouth. Tonight, I am the queen of peaches. Tonight, I am the queen of eating my own words, of drinking my own medicine. I move from wine to gin. I wanted other women to love you so I didn't have to watch you die. Now you have a woman riding on the back of your bike, 
wearing the helmet that made my back hurt because my neck is almost too long and narrow to hold my head up. You tell me we're so similar, me and this strange woman, this spooky bird that mates for life. Transfiguration. I turn myself over and over again, the way my angel spins his prism to catch a shred of rainbow, the way I rotate the sun gold that's nearly black from being so cracked to check for a full. I stopped watering. When I asked, when I ask what he learned at school today, he'll say, poppies, shadow puppets, woodcuts, mommy always comes back. We are seed pods with wings. In other words, floating homes. In other words, poems. Our halos are squashed, stretched, scribbled in haphazardly. My angel throws a book at me, then writes his name without prompting. Land legs. The man at the hardware store asks me what I'm looking for. Oh, me, I'm not looking for anything. My friend is looking for a spigot, but he's not my friend. He's a sunflower. He's Jesus with a tiny braid, mask strap mashing down his hair and his big ears, a tape measure in his back pocket, a denim jacket and a backpack full of clementines. From the beginning, I've said I'm no good at the physical world. I'm only good at words. Recognizing the pizza place meant wood-fired or handcrafted and not wood-crafted. That enchiladas before noon are brunchaladas. And that if I take a bath with this man, we're bath buddies, not fuck buddies, not buddy buddies, not friends with benefits, not necessarily lovers or people who need a single thing from one another, just two tender humans descending into water. Rutland. At Christmas, my sister asks, do you ever think about it? Never, I say, shocking myself at the quick and simple truth. She says, I just feel like a baby is always a good thing. And I say, that wasn't a baby though. It was a ghost passing through me. The memory comes back jarring, blazing sunlight on a single digit day. I'm driving south to a cabin in the woods for a retreat because my son is with his father and because I don't have a baby. The gray building is still there between a little Caesar's pizza and a church with a letter board. Be kind whenever possible. I try to model kindness for my son who goes on hitting me and screaming that he hates me while I try to love the ways he stumbles over being human. I traveled two hours because no provider in town had openings. I was already sick in that particular way, my breast speaking a heavy, urgent language. The nurse was kind. She held my hand because no one was allowed in the room with me, because all around us humans were dying from a strange disease. So I squeezed a stranger's hand, a kind stranger, a soft woman who gave me Teddy Grahams and apple juice when I almost fainted from the strangeness of it all. I think of my friend who needed a year of therapy after having an emergency C-section instead of a natural birth. I think of Little Caesar's Pizza, how C-sections were also named after the emperor 
or after the Latin word cedere, meaning to cut. I think of the rolling blade of a pizza cutter, and I think about the ways that babies try to tell our bodies they're not ready for this particular world. Yesterday, over bowls of cereal at our kitchen counter, my kid asked, do you ever feel lonely, mommy? My troubled angel, my brotherless son. In nature, we're wrestling when he digs his knee into the root of me, familiar tickle, throb and flare between my legs. His naughty smile pulls a string up inside me, buries me in dirt, leaves, leaves. The sun, my squinting, we roll around giggling. Maybe I'll never have another love. When we're done, my son picks the sticks from my hair. And this is my last one. Roden Crater. After James Terrell at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. Roden Crater is a gateway to observe light, time, and space. When I saw the models, ceramic, metallic, phallic, I was doing that thing where I walk through a museum pretending to feel something, which is a feeling close to the feeling of acquiring an extinct volcano, which this man did so he could make something visible from space. I wander through the exhibit nodding dumbly, then check out the strobe light installation that feels the same whether I close my eyes or open them, which is curious when talking about light. I can't tell what's behind my eyelids or in front of them, but the guy with the orange beanie perched on his head keeps making loud sounds so he can hear his voice echo through this sterile box of light. He's starting to annoy me and we're all wearing disposable blue shoe covers over our boots. I go back to the cabin and Google road and crater after smoking a little weed and heading out for a snowshoe on owl path to the edge of a cliff finding the mushrooms like so many moth wings up and down the birch. They mingle with the bark, they baffle the wind. The snow is like super fine sugar, dissolving quicker in the type of sunlight that makes you want to be the highest leaf on the tree. Some black capped chickadees are having a whole conversation. I swear the bird's eye view of road and crater looks just like one of those moth wing mushrooms. Google says it might be finished by 2024 with a $10 million investment from Kanye West. I text a friend, a mushroom lover. What are those little guys called? The ones that look like marbled wingy things? Now I know they're called turkey tails and I don't want to live in a world without them. Thank you. Thank you. I'm transfixed under the spell of your poems. Um, thank you so much, both of you. Um, truly, I feel lucky to have been part of this and to witness that. Um, so we have 10 minutes to, um, if we want to engage in a Q&A. And I think the easiest way to do that would be um, if people want to type questions into the chat and I can read them, but also um, if you would feel much more motivated to use your voice, you can unmute and we can try to do that politely. But I think, um, yeah, if you have questions, it would be less chaotic if you were to type them into the chat. So, um, Let's see, I'm going to switch my view here. Does anyone have any questions for our lovely poets this evening? 
If not, I can also come up with some. Well, okay, if I can do it by voice. Yes, definitely. Um, I just was noticing that both of you, I, I love your readings, um, seem to be conceiving of books, even like in your work in progress, I don't know, it's thematically. And I'm just curious if that was always the case or how, um, how you kind of work that out that, you know, now you're writing poems on this subject and it's gonna collect into something. Meg, do you want to talk about that since you have a book published? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, Rebecca, thank you for that. Um, so part of it is that um, a lot of the projects were were intentionally had a time constraint. So all of this, what I want to discover most of the time is how things change over time um, and like to focus on one thing. So like the the, the year of the comic year was a breakup and I wanted to witness, okay, what happens over a year? How does it change? How does it stay the same, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a, a process of observation um, given a certain constraint. And then the same thing, I wanted to do the same thing again for observing what it, what it meant to become a mother. Um, you know, a lot of people say before you, like if you've got a big pregnant belly hanging out there, if that, and that's one way to become a parent if that, and that was the way I became a parent, then people are like, it's going to be hard sleep now because you're never going to do it again. And like, you know, it, it's all different for every, everybody. And I was really curious about like, okay, what is my species of hardness when it comes to my experience of being a mom? And would that be helpful to other humans that are becoming parents to witness um, in artwork? And so that when I decide on when I decided on that and started journaling to collect the raw material for that, it was kind of um, I knew that it would go into a book about that process. And sometimes it's it hasn't always been the case. No, that like my poems will cohere into a group like that. But this one, it's more like I wanted to observe that year and see what happened, and um, and then the poems from that will be selected to become that collection. Yeah. What do you think, Julia? By the way, I've, I loved, loved, loved your poems. It, like totally luminous. Um, I'm really glad that human, like humanity evolved so that you could make them. It just like really worked up to something. It's incredible. Well, I love your <laughs> book. Thank you. Um, that means a lot coming from you. Um, I think for me, um, I, so my, my book um, is basically a like, evolved version of my um, manuscript that I graduated from my MFA with. And when I was in my MFA program, I was very like convinced that my book was a book about um, postpartum depression. And like as poems do, and I guess books do, like it took on a life of its own. Um, and it's a lot more interesting and a lot more nuanced and complex than being a book about postpartum depression. So um, those poems are still in there, but um, it, it has evolved from being um, like, it was the original title was Body Back. So it was like a conversation about the ways that we get our bodies back after we have babies, um, but it, became sort of it took mm -hmm. it, yeah I guess the best way I can say is it took on a life of its own and it um it, I cut a lot I added a lot in so um an evolving process and I think like those original the original impetus for the book is still in there but um it it became something surprising to me which was cool to witness <laughs> thank you both and I see a question has popped up in the chat uh, from Angela. And I don't know if you, since we don't have that many questions, you can feel free to ask using your voice, Angela, but I can also read your question out loud. So. Sure, it's totally fine. I was just curious as going off of, you know, Dennis's question about, you know, Meg, your illustrations, which Julia told me about, um, that you have illustrations with your poetry. I think it was beautiful. Thank you for sharing your screen. And, sharing us that, but I'm just curious, like, 
do they come with your poetry? Like, does it align that way? Do you draw something and then it draws, you know, inspiration for your poems? Just curious how that like creative process works. Cause I think it's pretty unique. Um, usually it's, um, it, the text comes first and it's when I'm walk, it often happens while I'm walking. So most of the pieces in the collection from a comic year were on my walk to work, I would speak the text into my phone and then get home, get to work, transcribe it into a shape of some kind. And then I would um, spend the day ruminating on the text to find an image that corresponded with it. Um, I was just reading um, the introduction to a collection of by Leonard Baskin, his uh, poetry and, and I mean, not poetry, um, illustrations and woodcuts and stuff, really, really amazing. And he talks about about the nature of illustration and how it, they have to, the images and the text have to be in conversation with one another, that they work together to reveal something about the central message of the piece and, um, and they work in exploration. It's not merely to illustrate the text, but to let the, all the marks work together to say something. And that was certainly what I was trying to do when I was um, adding images to the text that I want, you know, um, something else that is not possible possible without the image to emerge or um, emerge from the pairing, um, that it's like that the two are more together than they could be on their own. Um, so it's, yeah, but then like in terms of order, it's, it's like, it's usually thought, text, image, and then like panel, like I arrange the panel to manage both of those. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you're here, Angela. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. I think mm. it's really unique and it's really beautiful to have seen that together. So just because I know Julia so intimately, I can always see your poetry almost through your reading, Julia. But like for someone who I don't know as well, you know, like, like a stranger, it's really kind of helpful to have seen those images and it was really beautiful. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, my experience of reading Meg's work or reading your book Meg was like it it has such an embodied feeling right because we have like different senses that are being engaged when we when we experience your work in that way and I for me like I had so many moments reading Meg's book where I felt what I felt it in my body I was like yes like my body was like I recognize this this is familiar to me and um just beautiful way to experience poetry that is very, very gratifying to hear. That was certainly my my intent that um, that I was sharing in a, a bodily experience because so much of the book focuses on the body. I tend to be incredibly focused on the body, and um, and so yeah, to get into people's skin like that, and then hopefully the release that comes as um, from borrowing um, that feeling. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? We do have another question from Barbara, I believe. Thank you. Um, lovely reading. I loved how the sounds and the visual work together tonight. Bravo to both of you. I have to ask Julia how you got the bird out of the house. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's actually a very, very disturbing and tragic like second half of that story that's not in the poem, um, which <laughs> which is that I um, came home later and didn't see the bird and interpreted that as the bird let itself out of the house. And like my friends and people who are close to me know the story, but um, a few days later, I went into my closet and noticed a very bad smell and the bird was actually dead in my closet. So <laughs> there's potentially a sequel to this poem um, that I haven't written yet, but <laughs> you know, um, I think there's a lot there. I thought the bird got free and it didn't, but so, you know, could be another poem in there. <laughs> Question. So I don't want to keep folks um, just alerting us all that it, it is now eight o'clock. I just want to say, um, Thank you both so much for sharing your poems and also 
a little bit about your process and answering some of these questions. Um, so grateful and you know, on behalf of Sundog Poetry, um, thank you for sharing and also congrats again on being finalists in the Sundog Poetry Book Award. Um, we are here to celebrate you and I'm just in awe of your, of your work. It's really a magical evening that I've had with you. <laughs> thank you all for coming as well, everyone who's in attendance. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Thank you all. Thing. Thanks, Meg. There's a question about the video, getting a video of the reading. Is it something that we can have on YouTube at some point or? Yeah, so I um, did, I'm, am recording this. I missed, the. <laughs> I didn't record the first five minutes because I forgot, but um, we <laughs> luckily all of Meg's and Julia's presentations were recorded. So I will find a way to post that and I will announce that in our newsletter. So if you're part of the Sundog Poetry Newsletter, um, I will most likely share the recording there and then maybe also post on our website. So if you're not familiar with our website, it's um, sundogpoetry.org. I can put that in the chat as well. And if you didn't get a chance to um, look at the, the chat, I posted the websites of both of our poets, including in addition, the where you can find Meg's book, which is a comic year. So I'll put that information as well. Thank you for asking a good question about the recording. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll keep this open thank a you, Francis. minute, but yeah, definitely. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.